This is our second Google Lunar X Prize team hangout. Now tonight, instead of having a team with us, well, there's 18 teams and all of them are amazingly busy. Uh, they're working on preparing their cameras, their landers, their, well, all the things you need to get to the moon and rove across it or walk across it or fly across it whatever it takes. Um, instead, tonight we have with us Andrew Barton who comes to us from Google Lunar X Prize itself. Uh, he's here to help us understand what is the Google Lunar X Prize? What are the milestones and incentives that these teams are, are reaching for? And uh, what's, what is it that hopefully we will accomplish through all of this? Um, Andrew has a PhD in mechanical engineering that he got from the University of Sydney. Uh, he's worked in governmental space agencies, working at Aztec, which is part of the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. And he has uh, experience also working in the commercial world, but right now um, his home is with the Google Lunar X Prize, uh, where he works in technical operations. Um, Andrew, welcome to our show. I, I'm so glad that you're able to join us this evening. Hi, Pamela. Thanks, and uh, hi to all of the audience. Um, it's great to be with you today. Thanks for joining uh, this Hangout. Um, yeah, uh, I'd just like to, to say that, um, just, just to uh, round out what Pamela was saying, I'm the, I'm the Director of Technical Operations for the Google Lunar X Prize, and uh, I work for the X Prize Foundation in Los Angeles, um, and our sponsor, Google, uh, headquartered up in the San Francisco area, of course, is the uh, is the prize benefactor, the main uh, the main sponsor. And and for those of you who have any questions for Andrew. Um, we are watching for your questions on the YouTube feed and on the Google event page that is part of the Google Lunar X Prize page on Google+. The best place for you to get us your questions is through YouTube. Uh, we have the Q&A app installed and uh, we're here listening for what you have to ask. Now I, I think one of the, the first things to start with is one of the most common misconceptions about the X Prize. Um, I, I know I've seen people who work with the Google Lunar X Prize who start getting asked, hey, can you hook me up with Google stuff? Um, you guys are not actually part of Google. That's right. No, we, X Prize Foundation is an independent organization um, sponsored by Google. Um, and uh, we've, we've had other sponsors in the past for the other prizes that we do. And uh, the first X Prize was the Ansari X Prize, which was for suborbital space tourism. And uh, I'm sure most, if not all, of the audience would be familiar with the fantastic work that was done by Scaled Composites um, with the Spaceship One, uh, which was uh, then, the technology was then licensed uh, to uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic Company. and. Um, that was back in 2004, that prize was, was won. And since then, uh, XPRIZE has been running a number of other prizes, both in aerospace and outside of it. Um, within aerospace, we had the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, um, which was won in 2009 by Maston Space Systems with a, uh, a runner-up uh, prize going to Armadillo Aerospace. And the Google Lunar X Prize was actually launched before that, but um, has been running for a long time, and uh, we're now approaching the end of the Google Lunar X Prize. The, the prize money is available till the end of next year. And, and this builds on an amazing heritage of people recognizing that sometimes you have to incentivize, um, adventure is not quite the right word, but that's sometimes how it feels. The innovation required to do more, go further, try harder, um, to innovate something great. And, and this actually goes all the way back to the flight of the Spirit of St. Louis across the Atlantic, which was the winning flight to win the Orteg Prize. And that was just $25,000, but uh, when you think back to when it was won, that was a huge sum of money. And 
the thing about these prizes is when Charles Lindbergh was getting ready to fly across the Atlantic, he fully recognized that while $25,000 was a large sum of money, that wouldn't necessarily cover all the effort, all the flight costs, all of the innovations that were needed. And with the um, Ansari Prize, with the Northrop Grumman Prize, the Ansari Prize went to the first spacecraft that was able to uh, go uh, up above a certain altitude basically to reach above the atmosphere and return to Earth twice in a short period of time. Um, the Northrop Grumman Prize uh, was to take your spacecraft, go up into the air for a certain amount of time, either 90 seconds or 180 seconds, return back down and repeat. Um, all of these prizes require a lot of cost to be invested, and the prize is an incentive only. Uh, do you have any feel for just how much these different teams might have to invest as, as they reach for the moon? Um, <clears throat> roughly speaking, the kinds of missions um, which, which we expect these teams to do are in the, uh, in the tens of millions of dollars in cost. Um, the sort of minimum price for a launch vehicle that could get um, your spacecraft to the moon is already um, approaching $20 million. Um, and, and $20 uh, million dollars is the prize that, that Google has put forward for the mission that, that makes it to the moon, travels 500 meters, and sends back high-definition vid video. Right, so that's that's the grand prize. There's also a few other prizes. I'm sure we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, we expect that um, teams will probably spend more money than that to do the mission, perhaps by a factor of two or two and a half times more. And what, what's interesting is, is, as you pointed out, this is a fairly old prize. It's been around for a long time. And there are still FAQs floating around the Internet saying, um, we expect to see the first launches in 2013, that the prize will be decreased, uh, in fact, by the end of 2013 to 15 million. Um, the rules on that have been changed to it gets decreased if, if a governmental agency lands on the moon now. Um, how has this changed and what are the major factors that, that have changed the Google Lunar X Prize over its history? That is all of that old stuff sort of sticks around, so you can you can find it and dig it up. But uh, the downside is it can be a little bit confusing, I suppose. Um, but essentially, um, the there were lots of people involved, lots of teams, lots of stakeholders, and um, X Prize, you know, had a, had the attitude of, you know, we're not sure we've got it right the first time. We're not perfect. Um, let's launch this prize and see what happens. And as we go along, we learn certain hidden requirements uh, come out of the woodwork, if you like, and so certain things just needed to be changed. And uh, in fact, we're now on the fourth version of the master team agreement, which is the contract that the teams and XPRIZE sign to basically declare how they're related in this, in this prize competition. Um, and so you, you've just mentioned a few of the biggest changes that have happened over the years. So the, um, the, the original expiry date was um, end of 2014. And um, that was uh, also uh, uh, the prize would have already dropped to $15 million by the end of 2014. It was only originally meant to be the $20 million up until the end of 2012. Um, so, uh, but of course, as, as we approached 2012 and it became clear that there weren't any teams ready to go yet, um, Google and XPRIZE decided to, to take away that particular uh, rule. And so the, the prize money was kept at $20 million. And um, at a certain time, I think it may have been the same, the same change in the rules, um, it was extended till the end of 2015, which is the current uh, deadline still. And uh, that, that drop in, price, uh, that, that drop in uh, prize money was uh, removed, as I said. There was another one which you just briefly mentioned, which was the, um, the government landing penalty. And um, that was basically a $5, a five million dollar reduction in the grand prize. Um, if a government got there first and did a mission which was substantially similar to um, to the Google Lunar X Prize teams, that particular rule was um, decided to be removed. Uh, I think close to two years ago, uh, quite some time before the Chinese uh, 
made their launch attempt. And they, of course the Chinese did land on the moon recently uh, with a robotic lander. And it does have substantially similar capabilities to the Google Lunar X Prize requirements. However, as, as many of the audience will know, it, uh, the rover didn't go very far. And um, uh, as, as I understand it, it, it did not and it probably will not reach 500 meters. So as it happens, even that mission would not have uh, dropped down the prize, the prize money uh, according to that rule. And, and 500 meters is, um, to, to put it in, into American terms, that's roughly five football fields, uh, which is similar in size to five European football fields, just change out the sport. Yep. Um, and, and that doesn't seem like a large distance, but the, the Mars rovers took... Uh, substantial time to go that amount of distance and uh, Lunahood is one of the Russian rovers that was fly by wire. There's a human being on Earth uh, watching the images coming down essentially steering that Soviet craft uh, several decades ago across the surface. It's one that was able to make it several miles, tens of miles in reality and it holds the record for roving on the moon. Um, but technology like that is very hard, and uh, building something that will survive the lunar night is, is a challenge that has to be met as well, and that's the one that gets struggled with a lot. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, the, the basic uh, grand prize of the Google Lunar X Prize doesn't require your uh, system to survive the lunar yeah. night. That's and true. the lunar night is extremely cold, um, way below uh, freezing point. In fact, it's, it's so cold that uh, a lot of conventional electronics would just sort of uh, freeze up and crack and the circuits wouldn't work anymore. So uh, it's far from simple to des design systems that can work in that environment. Um, but uh, that, that's one of our bonus prizes, in fact. So so let's, let's look at the original rules. I think we, we've hit... Uh, a lot of what's going on. There's a $20 million grand prize for the landing, the getting your thing, whatever it may be, and there's all sorts of diverse designs. 500 meters, sending back the HD video. But various incentives have, have been put in place, various milestone prizes. Um, so, so, so there's the operation at night, traveling more than five kilometers over the lunar surface, detection of water, precision landing near uh, the Apollo site. Um, sorry, those are bonus prizes, not milestones. Um, and then there are the milestones as well. And the milestones are actually, um, for lack of a better word, juried prizes where you have judges following around the team. And this, in this case, you've selected teams to look um, to have their landers followed, uh, their mobility systems followed, and their cameras followed. And this is really interesting because it, it's something where you have judges going out and tracking the teams as they go. What was the, the history of coming up with this and uh, team selection and, and how do you move forward as teams work towards launch? Yeah, so the, the milestone prizes um, came into the story quite late. Um, the, the planning for the milestone prizes started only a little bit over a year ago. And um, what we realized at that point was it was still very difficult for, um, for teams to to you know, make all that progress necessary to get ready for launch and then launch and then do their mission. Um, and you know, the biggest problem is just raising the funds to do that, to pay for all of that equipment and all of that expertise that you need, insurance and all sorts of other things you wouldn't even imagine. Um, and so you know, money is a really big problem, um, but also technology just having access to the technology to do this stuff. And um, so the milestone prizes were basically set up to, to give teams an extra boost towards their mission goals. And so what we did is we took that, that the total prize purse, um, of which $20 million is the grand prize, also a second prize and, a, and bonus prizes, the total prize purse is worth $30 million. We took $6 million out of that and we said, okay, we're going to make that available to teams before they launch. Um, teams which are 
substantially ahead, they're substantially along the way to their mission preparations and who've proven that um, they're going to be doing some important work uh, in the coming year. And so basically we've, we've um, we set up a sort of prize within a prize where these teams uh, were competitively selected from amongst the other teams who chose to participate in the milestone prizes. Not everybody had to participate, it was optional. Um, and uh, th those teams who applied to participate submitted a plan um, describing what they do and we had a sort of independent panel of experts, our judging panel, who reviewed those plans and selected um, teams who were the strongest um, in each of those three uh, technical categories, landing system, mobility system and imaging system. Um, and uh, so what happened is five teams got selected. Um, there's a mixture of uh, which subsystem they're going to be going for, um, but those five teams now have the chance to, to share in that six million dollars of prize money that we're going to be bringing forward. So this money um, is not in addition to, the, to their grand prize, but it will be subtracted from their grand prize should they win it in the future. And and what's interesting about why this about how this is set up is Google recognized that they didn't want to staunch the uh, possibility of a team realizing, hey, we suddenly are competitive at this and basically being a come from behind team that accomplishes the 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 requirements for the Google Lunar X Prize at the last moment. And so they've upped the ante. They've said we're willing to put forward up to forty million dollars. And so it's possible for a team that didn't achieve one of the milestones to be the overall winner and the teams that, that get the milestones get to keep the money. Now the unfortunate side effect of this is also the other side is um, if you're a milestone winner then you still max out at being able to win 20 million at most. So it, it's kind of interesting that they're still encouraging while well, registration for the prize closed back in 2010 um, and there's only 18 set active teams. It's still possible for there to be a outside winner that wasn't one of these milestone selected teams. Right. So it's not um, it's not required that you make it into the milestones to be able to win the grand prize. It's it's, it's not a down select if you like. It's right. an optional program that we've added later um, to you know to help those teams along. And um, you know the as you mentioned the the overall prize purse because we had the possibility that teams uh, who didn't participate in the milestone prizes went on to win the grand prize, we had to just have the possibility to extend the prize purse a little bit, so it goes up to actually $40 million if required. Right. Um, so so the teams that, that are currently uh, moving forward with these milestones, uh, we have Astrobotic, which is competing in the landing, mobility, and imaging categories. Uh, Moon Express has been selected for the same landing, mobility, imaging. Uh, Team Indus has been selected for landing and imaging. Part-time scientists were selected for um, mobility and imaging. And then, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Hakuto. Uh, was selected for the mobility prize. So there is a set of five of the 18 active teams that have been selected by the team of judges to move on in these categories and have their progress in landing mobility and imaging monitored towards completion of these milestones. Right, and so all of, you know, a lot of the attention is now on these five teams because they've, they've got uh, deadlines. They've got until the end of September to prove to the satisfaction of the judging panel that they've hit their milestones. Um, and the way they do that is by, um, by sharing their technical progress with the judges. So the judges are invited to technical meetings to go over the team's work and look at their data, look at their test results, ask them questions to, to make sure that the teams understand what they've done and actually have done what they say they were doing. Um, and also witnessing tests. So the judges will go out to the team's premises or, the, or their the partners' premises and, and look at uh, the testing take place. And one of the one of the important things to note about these milestone prizes is um, the different teams define their own milestones. So the actual work they're going to do is a bit different depending on their overall approach to the mission and what they consider to be their critical risks. 
um, and uh, the judging panel then selected them based upon their overall plan and how they're planning to uh, overcome those risks. So let, let's look at what, what's included in these three different things. Um, uh, the word mobility I know can be a bit challenging to people simply because we're so used to using the word rover. Mm. And I love that Google Lunar X Prize uh, didn't fall prey to restrictive language that, that might squash imagination. What, what all goes into the mobility milestone? So yeah, we chose the word mobility because what we really want to have out of the prize is a capability to move around and do useful stuff on the lunar surface. Um, and actually, if that's all you want, you don't need to specify whether it's a rover or it's a, a flying vehicle or it's a mole that drills under the surface or, or a ball that rolls along the surface. All you need to, to verify is that, that something can move in a deliberate way across the surface. Um, so deliberate meaning you, you, you show that it can follow a path which you're, you're commanding it to follow. Um, and so the judging panel will be looking for that kind of thing with the mobility prize. Um, so there are four mobility prizes available as part of the milestone prizes. Um, Moon Express is uh, one that's going for the flying uh, option. So their landing vehicle will then, after it's landed on the moon, it will hop. So they're going to demonstrate that hop as part of their um, mobility prize. But the other, uh, the other three teams in the mobility category are, are doing more conventional rover type vehicles. Um, so, so I'd like to remind our audience that if you have any questions for Andrew, uh, you can enter them using the Q&A app. You can put them in a comment on the Google Lunar X Prize event page. Uh, and I'm also monitoring Twitter because I'm kind of a Twitter girl. Love Google Plus. Still addicted to my 140 characters. So, uh, send us a tweet with uh, GLXP. Uh, either hashtag at and then I'm at Starstrider. Are you on Twitter, Andrew? I am, actually. Um, I think <laughs> I don't use it very often, so I'm, I shouldn't I should know this. Um, I think my handle is Bartox, B-A-R-T-O-X, but I'll just look it up for you. <laughs> so so we're happily yes, uh, over on Bartox. Twitter. OK, so so you can tweet uh, at Google Lunar X Prize, hashtag, uh, GL, sorry, at GLXP, hashtag GLXP. I'm monitoring those. Um, and, and always YouTube and the Google Plus event page. Um, so we have the, the mobility challenge. Um, getting to the moon is one of the more interesting challenges as well. So, so there's two parts to that. One of these isn't a milestone prize, um, the other one is. So, so when we look at getting to the moon, there's the general problem of you have to get off the planet. Um, this is ge generally done, you launch to Earth orbit, you transition from Earth orbit to uh, a lunar uh, interception orbit, uh, end up going around the moon, and then you land. Uh, several of the teams have looked at their own launchers, others are looking to purchase them. Um, many eyes are on the uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy Lift that's coming in hopefully Q1 of 2015. Um, the landing milestone does not mean you have to develop the Falcon Heavy Lift. What all is involved in, in the landing milestone? Yeah, right. So the, the challenge of, of launch from the Earth's surface just to get into space is actually probably the biggest challenge there. But uh, we're fortunate that, um, that most of that, most of those technologies have already been developed by, by humanity um, over the last decades. So what we're doing now is, is looking at the next step, which is once you're in space, how do you land on the moon? So we expect that most of our teams will purchase their launch vehicle on the commercial market. And, and obviously, companies like SpaceX with their Falcon rockets are are good uh, possible suppliers for that. But there are many other companies around the world um, who can do that. So um, essentially, the, the launch problem reduces to a financial problem, finding the money to pay for that vehicle. Um, but the real, the real risky stuff is, is, the, is, the, is the approach and the slowing down and the touch down on the lunar surface. And that's only been done successfully by, by three nations. One of them, China, only very recently. 
Before that, of course, the, the Americans and the Soviet Union did that um, back in the 60s and early 70s. So um, we're, in the Google Lunar X Prize, we're saying we want private industry to develop that same technology. And um, for the milestone prizes, um, we, we allowed the teams to propose uh, risk reduction activities associated with landing um, that included anything from the lunar approach um, to uh, final touchdown. And uh, the kinds of problems you're going to have are, are making sure that you're aiming for the right part of the moon or even making sure that you don't miss the moon entirely and shoot off into deep space. Um, then you need, to, um, you need to slow down, so you need to uh, figure out when you have to do your braking maneuver, um, and you need to somehow make your velocity, your speed, uh, equal to the surface of the moon. So eff effectively zero speed with respect to the moon's surface um, to have a soft touchdown. Um, the soft touchdown, of course, is required because you really need to be able to have some complicated system to be able to go off and do that deliberate mobility we talked about earlier on. Um, and so when you're talking about a uh, soft touchdown, you need to have a throttleable engine, throttleable propulsion system. Um, you cannot use parachutes or, or just airbags because uh, there's no atmosphere on the moon. And uh, you're also your speed as you approach the moon is extremely high, far too high to absorb the impact with airbags. So you need to have some sort of propulsion system, which is quite advanced, and uh, some sort of guidance system to make sure that you just get that, you slow your velocity down just at the right point in time when you, when you touch the surface. So what you, you've, you've nicely explained why this is a new prize that is actually somewhat different from the Northrop Grumman competition that NASA awarded, um, which had people going through the, the landing and hopping around activities on the surface of the Earth. The lack of atmosphere is a bit of a challenge. So, so we have the landing milestone, the mobility milestone. Um, the camera milestone seems like a strange one to have given all of the experience that uh, we've had on Mars, all of the camera experience we have with um, Earth-facing satellites such as those that have been getting used in, in the hunt for Malaysian Flight 370. Mm. What makes this such a unique prize for people to chase after? Um, it's got different requirements to those um, things that you mentioned. Um, when you're imaging things up close on the moon, it's, it's quite different from imaging things from orbit. So you've got a camera with a finite focal length. Um, also, uh, it's got to be small and rugged and survive the extremes of temperature, the lunar dust, uh, radiation. So um, the camera system you'd have on a, on a Google Lunar X Prize mission is quite different from one you'd have in lunar, in Earth orbit. Excuse me. Um, it's, it's perhaps more similar to what you might have on the surface of Mars for the um, for Mars missions, but um, those missions are all government-run missions, and they're um, in a very different cost structure. They're far more expensive. Um, they're far more um, sophisticated. Uh, so what what we're basically uh, challenging our teams to do is is to develop a new camera system which is um, cheaper, easier to use probably using um, more off-the-shelf equipment, but qualifying that equipment for the space environment um, and proving that it can survive those, those damaging uh, environmental factors that I mentioned. Um, and also, it's, it's the first time that this um, that will have moon casts, so broadcasts from the moon. And uh, back, in the, um, back in the Apollo days, there, there was a, a live transmission of, of TV but it was very low resolution, and the, the most famous image of, of Neil Armstrong stepping off the off the lander um, is an example of that. It got a bit better during the Apollo program, but it never reached what we're used to seeing just by clicking a button and looking on our on our on our tablets on on the modern internet. So what we really want to do is be able to bring um, live imagery and video from the moon directly to Earth, um, and that requires um, uh, good cameras, small cameras. Um, and good digital transmission systems uh, back to Earth. And and that last bit is is something that can't be overstated in terms of how challenging it is. I, I think all of us have uh, somewhere in our possession an HD camera that can survive being thrown in a backpack during a traumatic bike ride. Uh, sometimes they're attached yeah. to laptops, sometimes they're attached to phones. Uh, and while 
the launch of a spacecraft is a whole lot more shaking and g-forces solving things for for vibrations is is one of those fun engineering problems that all of us love to torture our students with and the students love to accept the challenge yeah. what is harder is we've all struggled with the fact that if you go in your backyard or on your balcony or to your neighbor's apartment with your computer you very quickly lose Wi-Fi signal the moon's a whole lot further away and they're using completely different technologies than Wi-Fi but the basic problem of getting significant transmission energy is a, is the same issue how do you get enough energy into this little tiny thing and little because weight is what you're paying for to get it there so so you're weight restricted your power constricted and you have to be heard on the planet earth what do you think from a technical operations point of view is is the greatest challenge among these that these teams are going to have to overcome given the off the shelf and new technology they're chasing down on lower budgets yeah it's it's a system problem um, you uh, you have to develop something that that meets all of these different requirements um, and performs all these different functions many of which are new and haven't been done before um, all the all the basic physics is well understood for centuries or decades at least and um, uh, there's a lot of off-the-shelf equipment you, that you can use but putting it all together bundling that all into one package one system um, that works relatively reliably I mean we're not asking them to work for 10 years on the lunar surface they just have to go long enough to be able to complete their mobility yeah. um, objectives but that's not that's not easy so so designing that system which is small enough and light enough but also works under those demanding conditions um, and with the necessary quality, it, it, it's a system challenge, and um, it, it generally it re would require interdisciplinary work. You, you couldn't have just one engineer do the complete system. That that person would be a complete guru. I, I don't know anybody who could do the whole thing. No, you need the optical engineer, the elect the electrical engineer, the computer scientist, the mm. mechanical engineer. Uh, mm. Take an entire engineering department. Take the top person from each, and you might have a chance. Yeah, it's, it's system engineering, I think, and that's, that's a discipline which is starting to come out uh, in academia over the last uh, decade or two. Now, one of the other great benefits that these guys have over the Apollo astronauts is the ability to 3D print, and uh, Noel Rupenthal uh, actually asks, how extensively is 3D printing being used in these projects? Um, I've seen a few teams using 3D printing for prototypes of their systems. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's going to send hardware to the moon, which was 3D printed and then sent to the moon. Um, although there's no reason you couldn't do that. Um, so it's it's a new technology which is being used. Um, I, I, it's hard to say how much. We don't have full insight into all that, what all our, all our teams are doing. Yeah, you you have the fortune of getting to watch all of the teams and the misfortune of not getting to sit in all yeah indeed necessarily indeed. front row seats um, so as as all of this goes on what has been perhaps I guess the most surprising thing that you've seen coming out of the the innovations in watching I guess society's been following this with social media you you're essentially running a game of uh, Survivor with Rovers. <laughs> yeah, um, well, there's, there's now a huge volume of information on, uh, on YouTube published by all of our teams and uh, there's a massive diversity of approaches to, uh, to how to... Um, it's, it's incredible. You never could have anticipated all the different ideas that people have come up with. You know, people, um, people are proposing to have uh, little kangaroo-like vehicles that hop, you know, with um, with the spring type of action or rocket-powered propulsion, um, uh, you know, worms and, and balls and um, all sorts of, those are the sorts of obvious things that you can think of as how to move across the lunar surface, but also there's the there's the sort of higher level questions of how do I get to the moon? Do I, do I make my own launch vehicle, um, which is very difficult, very expensive, probably ten times more difficult than uh, 
in the Google Lunar Prize mission, most people want to buy their launch vehicle. But once you've decided to buy a launch vehicle, um, how big should that launch vehicle be? Um, would you be the only passenger or not? Where does it drop you off? Um, in, in which orbit? Uh, does it take you all the way to the moon or does it drop you in a low Earth orbit and then you need to propel yourself out of there towards the moon? And one of the more interesting questions is, should we cooperate with other teams? And uh, there's actually all sorts of cooperation yeah. uh, in there, in our, in our 18 teams. Um, some teams are talking about uh, sharing uh, a launch and then they'd separate when they're in space and each land independently. Um, other teams are talking about even sharing a lander and uh, having separate uh, mobility vehicles to do the to do the surface mission. So this is one of the strengths of an X Prize is that um, because you don't you don't prescribe the uh, solution, you only prescribe the um, the requirements. Um, you you benefit from a huge diversity of approaches, and uh, and that's what we're really seeing here. And. It, it's been amazing to see how, over the history of it, different teams have merged, and uh, you're building a, a community where we're seeing, um, with these global teams, what was seen somewhat with NASA contractors, where Martin Marietta and Lockheed and all of these different corporations of the 60s, 70s, and early 80s have slowly been merging. Um, but it truly is a new future that's getting built. And, and Eric Collins asks, so in a couple of years, can we expect to hear an announcement for the Google Lunar Street View Prize? $100 million to the first team to return Street View quality panoramas every 500 meters over a distance of at least 20 kilometers? <laughs> I wouldn't rule it out. Um, <laughs> we're always looking for new prize ideas. And uh, yeah, I mean, as soon as there's a need, we're going to be interested in that. And th this all starts to go back to the communications problem. Once you start having to send something back every 500 meters over two kilometers, oh, wow, that's a whole lot of data coming back. And Daniel Sprouse asks, what percentage of the communications with the landers is the responsibility of the team versus the responsibility of the X Prize? Uh, they, they do all of the communications between Earth and, and the Moon. Um, they then uh, basically give us the data to prove that they did the mission. Um, we'll have uh, one or two judges in the mission control center seeing that data coming down live and they'll verify that that's really coming from the moon. Um, but essentially, we the complete the onus is completely on the teams to do the mission. Everything they have to do, including the telecommunications. Um, they then send us a data package which we will uh, publish for the world to see. And, and what's kind of awesome is I'm getting live information from our audience right now. Space Ref Business published an article today on March 1st. I don't know if you've had a chance to review this. It was published at 8.49 p.m. Uh, so this, this truly is hitting us uh, right now. Um, and it's an article on interorbital systems common propulsion common propulsion module test vehicle uh, thundered off its mobile launch unit on its maiden voyage. Uh, do you find that things are flying fast and furious and do you know anything about this particular uh, test of the moment? Huh. Um, so Interorbital Systems is uh, a partner company of uh, our team called Synergy Moon and um, so Interorbital Systems is based out in Mojave, California, um, and I know they've been developing a rocket system. They're actually one of the only teams which considered it, uh, considers the approach of developing their own launch vehicle, and I believe uh, this launch is uh, part of that program. Um, but I don't have a lot more details. I also saw that just before going live today, so I didn't have a so chance to read it. So forgive me for, for coming yeah. up you with something being sent in live from our audience and thank you so much for that link it came in from at space commerce um, it's it is an active community out there participating mm. in all of this mm. um, it, it keeps it challenging to keep up with everything that that's going on um, it it really is um, 
a whole variety of different things that come out of this. We also have Daniel Sprouse asking, do any of the teams have plans to test their lander's duration? And this sort of builds into the 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 extension uh, uh, goals that are part of the XPRIZE. Can you talk anything about the duration? The duration of the flight? Of the lander. Mean? Of the lander, sorry. Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, um, so, so what what Daniel asks is, uh, do any of the teams have uh, plans to test the the duration of their lander? I, I think this means how far they can go. Um, and and this this fits in with uh, the mission objective of traveling more than five kilometers over the lunar surface. Oh, okay, okay. So it's the. Um, yeah, we normally uh, refer to that as the rover, uh, which is doing the, the surface uh, uh, traverse. Um, so um, a lot of teams have been testing their rovers um, and uh, publishing their results on YouTube, as I mentioned, so you wouldn't have to uh, go very far to see a GLXP team doing that kind of work. Um, for, the, for the milestone prizes, uh, the judges will be looking very closely at the um, at the mobility capabilities, and so what one of the things they're going to look at is how is the team going to prove that um, that vehicle has indeed travelled the 500 meters? What what method of of measurement and what data will they bring back um, to to prove that to the judging panel? So during the milestone prizes, that the teams will actually do some tests uh, to show how that measurement system works. And and it it seems odd to have to test how far did I go, but um, you never know quite how are your wheels going to deform. And right. if you've ever ridden in taxis, the easiest way for a taxi cab driver to jilt you your fare is to lower the pressure in his tires and make their radius just a little bit smaller. Um, so there's all sorts of things you have to worry about. But but on the side of using tried and tested Earth off-the-shelf technology, um, there's great programs like ArduinoSat that are getting CANSATs using Arduinos into orbit. Are any, uh, we're being asked by Michael Jobin, are any of the Google Lunar XPRIZE teams that you know of, and this may be beyond the scope of what you know, uh, building Arduino technology into their projects? Um, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. I can't off the top of my head remember which teams, however. Um, uh, Googling uh, GLXP Arduino might uh, might give a better answer than I've just given. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I said earlier, there's 18 active teams all mm. working towards this. Uh, the five teams selected to the milestones are not the only ones in the competition. and that's 18 teams with 18 different sets of technology to keep track of. So mm -hmm. that, there's a whole whole lot of science going on. Um, so one of the things that, that I'm really loving that you're hitting on with um, these guys and gals out there have blogs, they have YouTube feeds, and all of this builds towards a $1 million award that's being given to the team that demonstrates the greatest attempt to promote diversity in the field of space exploration um, and and towards other education focuses inc including the Moonbot, the planetarium show that you've put out. Um, how does how do you bring all of these engineers to the let's communicate this as well and and what are the communications that you're loving to see the most? Well, the um, the diversity prize reflects one of the one of the key objectives of Google and X Prize in setting up the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, it's not just about the technology; it's about the impact it has on society back here on Earth. And so, what we want to see is is more people going into these science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, fields, the STEM fields, as they're called, yes. um, and um, we're trying to uh, to promote diversity in that. Uh, so um, the, the teams themselves don't need to be composed primarily of, uh, sorry, exclusively of engineers. Um, in fact, uh, teams can have anybody they want on the team. Uh, it doesn't matter what your background is, so long as you're adding something useful to the mission. So 
um, I suppose what the judging panel is going to look for when they when they make the final decision on the diversity prize is um, is what type of people were involved in the in the teams. Um, what sort of activities did they do to, to promote their team's work to a wider community and, and who did they manage to reach um, through those activities um, and uh, you know tr trying to estimate what, what level of, of change they had towards those, those higher level objectives that I just mentioned. And, and what's really neat about this is you do see new role models emerging out of this. You have Team Indus, you have uh, Team Hakuto. I need to learn how to pronounce that you better. You pronounced Japanese. it exactly correctly. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Japanese team. Um, so you have teams from nations that we don't usually think of as cutting-edge lunar explorers. Both of those nations have, have had governmental spacecraft, uh, Chandrayaan, Kagoya, uh, which is also called Selene, depending on, on which uh, set of naming you're looking at. Um, but now we have their everyday commercial space heroes, their um, spacefaring Chuck Yeagers and uh, Elon Musk, he's South African working in America. This is truly an international, diverse competition in every way. Yeah, so I think the um, the, the rules, the, the master team agreement, which defines the rules, it says um, the diversity prize will take into account all types of diversity, age, gender, nationality, uh, uh, expertise, any, anything. Um, and so we, we do indeed have the most uh, international space exploration program ever. I think there's, there's no doubt about that at the moment. The International Space Station, for example, has five or six uh, space agencies involved, um, you, including Europe, of course, which has many countries. But um, uh, it's, the Google Lunar X Prize is, is far more international than that. And uh, so. I suppose that sort of fits in with with the vision that uh, that we have for the future is that space is is not the the providence of one or a few nations. It's really the providence of all mankind. And and one of the awesome things is you're putting all of this um, expertise into getting to the moon, but you're also putting effort into educating that next generation that will hopefully be there finishing the job of establishing our home on the moon and and the Google Lunar X Prize Foundation um, has the Moonbots competition which I'm bringing up because it's currently open for registration um, and and Moonbots is is a project that invites kids up to age 17 to form teams and and is is this something that that you'd like to discuss any otherwise I'm happy to ramble gleefully about it because I, <laughs> I adore this project uh, you, you probably ramble more accurately than me that's <laughs> actually run by my colleague uh, Shanda Gonzalez um, so I don't know all the details at, at this point uh, but, so, uh, so as, as I said, I bring this up because it's currently open for registration. And if any of you out there work with school teachers, school groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Explorer Scouts, FAA, pick a group um, that likes robots. Um, it's moonbots.org. Registration open March 15th, closes May 15th. And it encourages kids to use the Lego Mindstorm platform to design their own way of winning a much more ground-based version of the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, and, and this is a great way to, to tell kids this could be you in the future. And for those of us born post-Apollo, um, I've never seen a human on the moon. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, my friends' kids walking around on the moon someday. Yep, absolutely. So um, the the moon bots is a great way for 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 kids to well have fun, uh, but also learn a little bit about um, what it takes to to explore space. And uh, so you know we're very happy that uh, it's been so successful. Um, uh, I I got to see the. Uh, two or three of the winning teams last year and uh, that, 
just like our teams in the, in the main Google Linear X Prize, those guys have all got very diverse approaches, and, uh, and it, it's actually a lot of fun. It, it really is, and um, the LEGO Mindstorm kits are excellent. There's uh, out-of-the-box kits, if you're not part of the competition, that science centers often have so that you can play along and be part of, of figuring out what's going on. Um, as, as we move forward, this Hangout series is new. We're still working on defining it, and I have to thank all of you for, for being here and helping us define where this is going to go in the future. Um, Andrew, you've been great on here, and I'm wondering uh, what parting things about this prize do you want our audience to walk away with and share around the water cooler tomorrow or this afternoon, depending on where they are on this rotating planet? Well, I suppose um, uh, I think we should look to the near future, and we should realize that um, by the end of next year, multiple private companies are planning to demonstrate an ability to deliver a package to the lunar surface, um, like FedEx. Uh, so um, given enough money, you too could send a package to the moon as soon as next year. Um, and then if you want to look a bit further in the future, um, maybe 10 or 15 years down the track, uh, people will also be able to fly commercially to the moon. Uh, just like we're now seeing people starting to fly into suborbital space. So in our lifetime, um, we will be able to visit the moon, given enough uh, financial resources. And, and as time goes by, it will get cheaper and cheaper. And, and in last week's show, uh, one of our guests mentioned that they'd heard rumors of someone buying the first proposed ticket for a tourist flight to orbit the moon for $150 million. And while this broke my heart, given how much money NASA doesn't have at the moment, it's still <laughs> amazing to dream about what's coming. And you've now planted in my head this vision of the Amazon drones delivering things to, to astronauts and hominid robots all over the moon as they build the communications networks, do the geophysics, mm. and try and set up our, our habitats for the future. Absolutely. The future. One filled with drones, but it's <laughs> Yeah, um, we have to love the robots. <laughs> I personally welcome our robot overlords. Um, <laughs> so so this, is, this has been great, Andrew. And I, I would like to remind our, our audience that this is just the start of this series. This is our second episode. The first one is archived on YouTube. It should be linked off of both the Google Lunar X Prize page and CosmoQuest. Um, I am the uh, principal investigator of the CosmoQuest uh, citizen science community where we're not trying to get to the moon, but we're trying to map the moon so that we know the scientifically interesting places and the safe places to land for these teams of the future. Uh, so if you're not on your way to going to the moon, spend a few minutes mapping the moon and join us each week as we find out how the folks at the Google Lunar X Prize Foundation, or at the X Prize Foundation working on the Google Lunar X Prize, are working to encourage these 18 teams towards a future of commercial space. Uh, next week's show is not going to be at this hour. We alternate between uh, hours that are ideal for uh, the two different hemispheres of the planet, east and west. Uh, so next week it will be a morning show at 11 a.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. London. Uh, that's really the one you need to remember. Tuesday, 4 p.m. London next week. Um, we are taking the week after Easter off and we'll be returning after that. Uh, subscribe to us, follow us on the Google Lunar X Prize page and you'll learn all you need to know to keep up with these explorations. Thank you so much, Andrew. This this has really been great, and I'm sure we'll have you on again. We're here to stay with this series, uh, so in the coming months, you will be back. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining, everybody. So thank you, and see you next week.